Good morning and welcome to Westside. I'm so glad you all are here. This is our second week back in person. And I'm so proud of all of us, how we've shown love and respect for each other, wearing our masks and social distancing and sitting with our families. And it does seem like a strange way to share love, but giving each other space is a way that we can protect each other and continue to worship together safely. And it is a privilege to worship together, all of us, all ages, in this room, in the chapel, the gathering place, and online. And while we are worshiping together, we're not having our regular Sunday school classes on Sunday mornings, and our kids are not with their Sunday school teachers each week, practicing the rhythm of journaling as a way to reflect on and communicate with God. So we've got bags in the lobbies, in the lobby, for kids to engage during the sermon time this week, and we also have journals for the kids and anyone else who wants one, except for this one's mine, so you can't have it. Um, And they're on the Welcome Center, and our hope is as pastors that as you use your journal today and during this week, and you bring it back each Sunday, that you will continue to use this as a spiritual practice that shapes you and your family. And we'll continue to talk about journaling and family worship and how these spiritual practices of us worshiping and discipleship together are shaping us in our homes. And make sure to take your journals home and use them throughout the week and bring them back on Sundays. So today, as we worship together, we are going to light the Christ candle. And our friend Katie's going to come up and light that for us. And this candle reminds us that Christ is present with us as we worship him, as we learn from God's word. God is already with us today and every day, and the lighting of this candle is a reminder of that. Thank you, Katie, for leading us in worship by lighting the Christ candle. Let's pray. Jesus, as we have gathered to worship together, I ask that you release us of our burdens, our fears, the scary things that are in our minds. Jesus, I ask that you clear our minds and hearts of these things and fill us with your peace, your joy, and your love. You are the Prince of Peace, and your peace passes all our understanding. I pray for your peace in our hearts and our minds today. Lord, we worship you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and worship together.
to be in the house of the Lord and to worship him. He is so worthy of praise. I want to be close, close to your side, so heaven is real and death is a lie. I want to hear voices of angels above, sing as one. Worship together this morning. Glad you're back today. 
Uh, we have 43 of our people up at Wind River, Wyoming. We want to keep them in our prayers this week as they minister to the Native Americans. Uh, on the reservation there, we want to pray that God work through them in a great and dramatic way. So pray for our teens and their leaders as they are gone this week. They will be back next Saturday night, probably. Yes. It might actually be Sunday morning. That's all I'm saying because uh, say you never night. know exactly what time. But the goal is Saturday night, July the 4th. Okay. Um, we want you to be aware that uh, we have made available the opportunity for Sunday school classes to meet on the campus. Um, we ca are trying our best to comply with a certain number of people on a Sunday or at one particular time. So I think it's okay if a couple Sunday school classes wanted to meet either Sunday night or any other time during the week, just contact Kathy Polk in the office and she will schedule a room for you, make sure it's sanitized, ready to go, and uh, we'll have that available for Sunday school classes. I know some of you are still meeting with Zoom meetings and we're grateful for that. It just helps us to stay connected. But we are available to have auxiliary classes and groups meet at the church. Just go through the church office to make sure we're not too many people here at one time, okay? Uh, we are going to just pray for the offering again for the next several weeks. For a while, anyhow, offering will be collected at the back of the sanctuary. Uh, as you come in or as you leave, if you'd like to put your uh, tithe checks and offering in the offering place back there, that will be the way we do it. Let's just take a moment and give thanks for the way the Lord is providing. Our precious Heavenly Father, today we count it a great privilege to worship you and to count uh, a blessing uh, from God that you are giving us, Father, what we need this day. We thank you, Lord, that you allow us to be involved in touching the lives of people in this community and in different parts of our country as we uh, are aware that we are taking the gospel and the good news uh, far away uh, to Wyoming this week. We're grateful, Lord, that we can participate uh, through the giving of our tithe and offerings. And Lord, for the way that you provide for us, how thankful. We just pray that you continue, Jesus, to pour open, pour out into our open hearts all of the resources we need to, to serve you and to live for you and to give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Isn't it wonderful to know that the chaos of this world does not define our God? Does it? There's chaos all over us, and life is hard, and life is sticky and messy, but... It doesn't define who our God is. He is worthy of praise no matter what is going on in our lives. It was my cross you bore so I could live in the freedom you died for And now my life is yours And I will sing of your goodness forevermore Worthy is your name
If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. But even if he does not, we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place. You alone deserve our praise. In the name above all names, be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place. You alone deserve our praise.
hurts. That song is hard to sing. Asking to be broken, asking to be empty, asking to be lonely. God, that hurts. But God, we sing this song, these words for you today, because we believe in your promises. Promises that are bigger than those things that hurt. You hold us in the darkness, in the fire, in the den of lions. You complete us. You satisfy our thirst and you make us whole. And even in our most brokenness, you have your arms wide open for us to run into. Wide open, waiting. You are true love. And because of your great love, we desire you for ourselves and for the world around us. And today as we stand in our rows with our family, we're just each gonna take a moment to say a name either out loud or in our minds. We'll share the name of someone that needs to know of your love for them. We'll say a name to lift them up to you in that breath of prayer. So right now we take that moment in a whisper in our minds or a bit louder to say their name. God, we lift these people up to you. People that are near and dear to our hearts. And while they might be far away from you, they are near to your heart too. You have a great love for them. And we pray today that they would know and feel and experience more and more of your great love in their lives. Thank you, God, for your promises, your promises of love to be with us and to make us whole. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Amen. In order to be kind, I cut last week's sermon in two. So we're going to finish it today as we look at convictions again. Uh, We we talked a little bit about the lives of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the book of Daniel and how we determined that they were people of conviction, that it just didn't matter uh, to them what kind of pressure they were under. They were going to live by what they believed. And we saw that begin to unfold last week as we looked at uh, some convictions. And today we're going to jump back into a few more uh, convictions that we have as followers of Christ. Um, Our story today kind of focuses on the classic good versus evil theme. I have some good news for you today. Good wins. Um, One conviction of mine is good always wins. Now, this is kind of cheesy, but good is God with an extra O, and God always wins. If you don't get that, I don't give a rip. It was pretty good. (laughs) Good always wins. (laughs) It doesn't always look like it's winning, but God is indeed victorious over evil. For sure, mark it down, it's true. Conviction of mine, God wins. Because we know this story of the, of, of the four young Jewish men really well, we can tend to minimize uh, just how difficult the trials were that they went through. We think about, oh, yeah, they were saved from a fiery furnace. Isn't that awesome? Didn't even have any smell of smoke on them. Oh, it was so easy for them to be cast into the fiery furnace because of God. No, there was fear and trepidation, I guarantee you. Daniel was protected from the mouth of the predators. The lions didn't attack him. He was so, it was just so wonderful. I, can't, I can just see Daniel just rubbing the heads of the lions, going, oh, nice kitty, 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 kitty. Maybe sometime during the middle of the night that happened, but when he was thrown in there, I guarantee you there was fear and trepidation. And we tend to do that. We tend to downplay just a little bit the human experience because we are so past the real time that those things happen that we have come to a place where we just kind of spiritualize it a little bit and take the humanity right out of it. These four young men were scared when they were facing these circumstances. 
but an underlying conviction moved them to come to a place where it didn't matter what the outcome was, they were not going to violate what they believed in. We can fast forward to the supernatural intervention of God and miss the real intensity of the battle that they faced in real time. The battle that people face today who are making decisions to live for Jesus, even if it means imprisonment or the lack of a job or possibly even death. There are people today in real time making those decisions as we worship here. I started to say in freedom and liberty. (laughs) I'm not sure we are experiencing freedom right now in our country. It just feels like we're in chain, doesn't it? A little, come on. Yeah, kind of does. And yet I tell you today, it's an exciting thing to think about that God is indeed involved with us. Conviction, God wins. We see three kinds of people In this story in chapter 3 today, we're going to look only at chapter 3. I'm going to let you read the story of Daniel on your own and and kind of just remember what happened in the uh, the life of Daniel as he uh, stood firm on his convictions. But but today we see three kinds of people in chapter 3 of Daniel. We see people who want godly convictions eliminated. They want God out of the scene. We see, secondly, people who wouldn't abandon their godly convictions or their God. And thirdly, we see people who are changed because of godly people living by their convictions. It's important for us to recognize that there is a segment of the society that wants God gone. Right now. (laughs) There's a desire to get rid of God from the public square. From the, the, if they can silence Christianity, if they can just somehow get us to stop talking about our God biblical worldview and the things that cause us to live the way that we do, if they can just stop that somehow, they can win this battle for the soul of people. There are people who want godly convictions eliminated, people who won't abandon their godly convictions or their God and people who are changed because of godly people living by their convictions. This is both true of the fiery furnace and the lion's den stories. How did what started out so well for these young men, job promotions in the kingdom, authority to oversee parts of the kingdom, end up in plots to have them killed? I have a conviction, another one Jealousy destroys. Wow. Jealousy is an evil trait. Jealousy is what captured the Babylonian officials. They didn't like the progress these four young Hebrew men were making in the empire, so they conspired to bring them down. Now we enter into Daniel chapter 3 as we think about all that took place in verses 1 through 12. We're going to read verses 8 through 12 here in just a moment. But in verses 1 through 12, we see what kind of culture Babylon is. It's a wealthy culture. There's an image of gold, 60 by 60 cubits in size. I don't know what you know about how much an ounce of gold costs, but 60 by 60 cubits of gold, that's a pretty rich statue. (laughs) There's an image of gold. It's a wealthy society. It's even wealthier now that they've overcome Jerusalem, overcome Judah, and brought all of the goods from Judah into their own coffers. It's it's an unbelievably wealthy culture. And then you have verses 2 and 3, where it talks about the dedication service of this great, grandest, grander and, and the glory of this kingdom. You, you see the pomp and circumstances in verses 2 and 3. In verses 4 through 6, we see the instructions that are given to the people. Worship the idol or die in the blazing furnace. Whenever you hear the music play, you're to bow down and worship the idol that has been constructed, this 60 by 60 cubit gold idol. You're to bow down and worship it as some sense of, of homage and honor. And, and every time you hear the music play, bow down and worship. That's the instruction. If you don't do it, if you don't do it, 
you'll be cast into the blazing furnace. And then we see the directives implemented in verse 7 where, okay, you've heard the decree, now it's going into effect. It's kind of like when they tell us some new guideline to follow and it's going to start on Monday or it's going to start on July the 4th or da-da-da-da-da. Here it is. This is when it starts. So now the decree has been made, and, it, and the comment is this. Now from this time forward, if anyone does not bow down and worship, they will be thrown into the fiery furnace. It is now effective. And now we jump into Scripture. Verses 8 through 12. Listen to this passage of Scripture. At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, may the king live forever. I've noticed that that's always a good thing to say to a king. You know what? May the king live forever, ever, and may I live too, <laughs> O <Old> king. <laughs> may the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipe, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold. And that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into the blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold that you have set up. The squealing began against the, the, the ones that refused to follow the commands, the Jewish guys. <laughs> there was a jealousy mounting up within the people of Babylon that these four young Jewish men were progressing up the chain, up the ladder, faster than they were, and they did not like it. So how can we take them down? I know we'll put before them a moral dilemma. We'll talk the king somehow into creating a decree that will cause them to be in a place of decision, and we'll see what they do at, this, at that time, because we've known these young guys to be men of character. But now they have to bow down and worship something that is not God at all. What will they do? Oh, by the way, king, your majesty, long live you, these guys aren't complying with what you said. You know what you said, king? Do you remember what you said? And I love it when people remind you of things you say. Does anybody ever do that to you? Do your words ever come back to haunt you sometimes? Like, oh, I guess I did say that, didn't I? And I, I am one that's on public record all the time, so all you guys have to do is go back and watch this sermon again and go, yeah, you really did say that. Listen to it right there. And then call me. And say, Pastor, I love you. Long live you, Pastor. <laughs> but did you know? And they brought before the king's attention. Did you know these guys are? You put them in charge and authority over parts of the province. And yet they are living such pitiful examples of your authority. They are ignoring you. They are snubbing their, no their finger. Their finger? <laughs> They're snubbing their nose at you. Not their finger. You could, you could see how they would try to create a sense of, you've got to respond, king. You decreed something. Is your word worth anything? And so the king, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, it says, was in rage. Verse 13, he was in rage. You know the story, the king then brings the guys in and he questions them. He gives them a chance to right the wrong and to bow down and to fall down and worship. And the king makes it clear in verse 15. He says, if you don't do this, you're going to be thrown into the fire. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? If you get to that place where you refuse, I guarantee you, you're going to burn up in that fire. There is no God who can protect you from my hand. I am the authority. 
time for another conviction. Verse 17 and 18. This might be one of my favorite convictions in this entire story. The young men said, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. One of my favorite convictions is knowing that God can do anything. I believe in his power. I believe that God is able, don't you? And yet, I also recognize that even if God chooses not to do something the way that I would like for him to do it, I am not going to turn my back and walk away from him. I'm not going to just say, then he, he's, an, he's not a good God. There are so many people that get broken because things don't quite happen the way they want them to. And yet these four young men said, you know what? My God can deliver us from your hand, O king. But even if he doesn't, I will not walk away from my convictions. I won't worship another God. Even if I perish in the furnace, I will not worship another God. I love that conviction. It makes me think about questions like, can you recall an experience in your life when your conviction placed you in direct opposition to those in authority over you? I know that there are friends of mine in the past who have given up jobs because of a conviction they have for God that they would not do what they were being asked to do you remember when um, some years back the, uh, the Affordable Care Act came in to be and at that time one of the responsibilities of people working in hospitals is that they had to participate in even b abortions. If they were a nurse, if they were a doctor, they had to participate in providing an abortion for someone that came in. and. Uh, an ER nurse in my church uh, who, who up until that time, a, a doctor or nurse would be able to, to pull away from doing that. They could say, I, I am morally against that. I do not want to participate in that. And they could back away from being involved in that kind of procedure. But when this took place, the pressure was upon them that they couldn't back away. And my ER nurse says, well, Here's how it is. I've been an ER nurse now for 17 years. It's very important to my family's uh, income <laughs> that I have this job. This is an important job. I've studied for it. I, I enjoy being a nurse. But if I have to participate in providing abortions that goes against my moral belief, I will not do it, even if it means my job. Any idea what happened? It meant her job. She walked away from something that she had prepared her whole life for and that great, gave great meaning and fulfillment. It wasn't long after that before she was hired again to serve in another ER that did not require her to do that. It was almost kind of like bad law, not going to make you do it. I don't know what you think about that. I just know that she stood up even if it meant the financial viability of her family. That's a tough one. How about this? Did you apply the principle that these young men did when you faced a circumstance? Did you have a conviction that God could deliver you or even if he doesn't, you will not deviate from your conviction that it was okay, the outcome, knowing that you had made the decision to follow what you believed? King Nebuchadnezzar was furious. I can imagine at that moment, the fire raging inside of him burned as hot as the furnace that he was heating up. You remember he says, make it seven times hotter than usual, verse 19 says. I want to make sure that this is hotter than it's ever been before and that these young men pay for their disobedience to my edict. 
The soldiers bound the young men, threw them into the fire in verse 23. I think it's important to recognize a sidebar, not a real great part of the story, but in verse 22, the soldiers throwing the young men into the furnace died because the furnace was so hot. As they got close to the opening, they actually perished because it was so hot and they threw the young men into the fire. These young men, another conviction, (laughs) these young men were not in the fire alone. Look at verse 24 and 25. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and he asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire. They're unbound. They're unharmed. And the fourth looks like a son of the gods. These young men weren't alone in the fire. I mean, we love this story because it brings in the supernatural element of God on the scene. It brings Jesus in the fire with them, protecting these young men who would not violate their convictions They weren't in the fire alone. The one who appeared to be like the Son of God was in there. I think it's important for us to recognize we're not in the fire alone. Sometimes our life seems intense, almost as if we're being consumed. It's not that hard to think that we've been abandoned. We're all alone and we're facing the consuming fire that rages. And I just want you to know that feeling alone is exactly what Satan would want it us to think that we're alone, that God's abandoned us, there's no one on our side, that somehow, some way, this thing is going to consume me, this problem, this fire. And if Satan can somehow convince us that we're alone, I, I, would, just like to, I would just like to say another conviction is we're never alone. Hebrews 13, verses 5 through 6 tells us that. He says, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? I mean, really, what can you possibly do to me that my God cannot protect me from? That my God cannot supersede? That the outcome of whatever happens to me here and now is nothing in comparison to what God has promised to me if I stay true to my convictions and live by what I believe. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego embraced that promise long before the author of Hebrews wrote it. The Son of Man was in the fire with them. Everyone there saw that the fire had not harmed them, not a hair on their head was singed, their robes were not scorched, and even the smell of fire was not on them. It's as if they had never experienced the fiery furnace at all. When they came out on the other side of the fiery experience, they came out unscathed. Loved ones, I have to tell you this morning, it is always that way. Sometimes there are scars after the battle. Sometimes it takes a long time to heal after a battle. They're reminders of what we went through. And yet I come to this conclusion that scars can serve to remind us of how great the Lord's presence was with us when we were in the fire. Almost a continual reminder that God is good, (laughs) that God always wins, that God promises to honor our convictions that are facing his will, and that God is the one that is able to heal. Scars can remind others of how great God is delivering people from the fire. And whether we come out unscathed or seriously injured and bearing reminders 
or even if we don't survive the fire or the storm or the trial or whatever you, word you choose to describe it, the truth is we are never alone. I love the idea that Jesus walks with us through the valley of the shadow of death. That as we enter into that time when we're making a transition from this life to the next life, something that we've never experienced and we're not quite sure what it's going to be, but as we make that transition, we have Jesus walking with us in that time of change. I don't know what that's going to look like or how it's going to be. I do know that I've had friends before that have said things like, re revealed to me in a time of talking with them, they've said things like, I, I, saw, I saw an angel in my, my room today. I, I heard a voice say to me that I'm coming home. I've heard someone often say to me things like, it's, it's not a scary thing anymore because I have this concept of something that is awaiting me. I've always believed in it, but it's now like I've been given this little preview of what it looks like. And their hearts are at peace. They've been given this preview of what Jesus is offering to us. And I think sometimes that we have failed to recognize that we really are not citizens of this world. We are citizens of another world. And that our focus too much of the time is upon what takes place here and now instead of what takes place then and there and what is being offered to us who live by a standard of conviction, a belief system. You do realize, don't you, ladies and gentlemen, that you can get to heaven in one manner, and that is to Jesus Christ through a belief in him who is the way, the truth, and the life and that you come to the Father through Jesus Christ, and, and that we recognize that it is through Jesus Christ that we've been given this set of ways in which to live, and, and we, can, we can find ourselves living our lives by the ways in which Jesus wants us to live. The, the scripture says in Matthew chapter 7, when Jesus is teaching on the Sermon on the Mount, he's talking about eternal destiny, heaven and hell, and he says there's, there's a pathway that leads to hell there's a gate that leads I mean pardon me to heaven there's a gate that leads to heaven it is Jesus Christ and through it we walk and as we walk it is a narrow path it is a it is a way that is guided to us by the will and the way of God and there's only one way and that is through obedience to what we know God wants us to do convictions to live by what we know so we enter through Jesus and we live by those convictions. And the scripture says, one of the saddest adjectives in all of scripture is that only few are on that road. And then Jesus says, but there's another gate that leads to destiny. And that gate is wide and, and, and it leads to destruction. And the, and the reality is that you can enter onto that road that leads to an eternity called hell in any way that you want. Any old thing serves as a pathway to hell. Only Jesus serves as a pathway to heaven, but you can get to hell in a variety of ways. The problem is, Jesus said, many, many, are on that path. A few are living by convictions on their way to heaven, and many are living by their own way and are on their way to destruction. And we don't like to talk so much anymore about heaven and hell. And I think most of us in the room would say, I don't mind you talking about heaven, but hell wigs me out. Right? And we've kind of had a generation now where we haven't talked much about eternal destiny. But there is a heaven and there is a hell because, not because I say so, but because Jesus says so.
And the sooner we come to grips with the idea that Jesus' words are eternal, the faster we'll come to the place where we live our lives by convictions. I'm not going to spend any time reminding us of Daniel in the lion's den in chapter 6, only to say that it's another example of convictions directing a person's choices in life, only to say this, that God can shut the mouth of the predators. (laughs) Praise be to God. Whether they're lions or people, God can shut the mouths of predators. Praise be to God. But that'll probably be a sermon someday down the line. Or not. I'm never quite sure until I get in the study and the Lord says, say that. But I will say this to you as we wrap up this idea of convictions. A song came out a few years back by Mercy Me that challenges me to be a person of deep convictions. It's a song that is simply entitled, Even If. Let's listen to it, shall we? And see what it says to us today. They say sometimes you win some, sometimes you lose some. And right now, right now I'm losing bad. I've stood on this stage night after night, reminding the broken it'll be alright. But right now, Oh, right now I just can't It's easy to sing when there's nothing to bring me down But what will I say when I'm held to the flame like I am right now? Say it only takes a little faith to move a mountain. Well, good thing a little faith is all I have right now. God, when you choose to leave mountains unmovable, oh, give me the strength to be.
This morning, it is well with my soul, and at the same time, it's not so well with my soul. I wish, like anything, that I could say something that would make people turn their attention to God. I wish God would just say the word, and this pandemic would go away. I wish God would just say the word and the racial injustices of our world would just go away. I wish that I had the ability to convey to you just how deeply I believe in my soul that God is able to do just that. But even if he doesn't, I want us to make sure that we keep our allegiance to God and follow Him and trust Him and know that one day, one day, He will say this, enough! And then, glory. Living by godly convictions change the people around us today and in the future. The last verses of this story, verses 28 to 30. I don't know if I can even read it. Now my eyes are blurry. Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than to serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble. For no other God can save in this way. Then the king promoted them in the province of Babylon. Godly convictions have a way of changing societies. Could it be at a time like this, we're needed more than we've ever been needed before? I think. Lord Jesus, help us today to recognize that we can live by convictions to do what you want, and to live the way you want, and that it will make a difference in the lives of people. You know, Lord Jesus, America needs a serious change to occur. We are all balled up and in a mess right now. And there's such division between us. I've never seen anything like it, Jesus. I pray for the church of Jesus Christ. That we rise up and live for you. Leave the outcome to you, Jesus. But I have this deep conviction, Father, that there will be people who will be changed for the kingdom's glory as the church truly is the church. I pray that you take little stories like the fiery furnace and you remind us that they have an eternal message, a relevant message, a challenging message. 
We trust you and believe, Lord, that you are indeed able to keep all things that we commit unto you against days like today. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to invite you to stand with me as uh, Pastor Alyssa uh, pronounces benediction for us today. Little housekeeping before the benediction after the service. Uh, please fellowship outside as our cleaning crew is going to come in and clean and sanitize before our next service. So please receive this benediction. Live this week with the courage and the faith of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The courage and faith that comes only when we are rooted deeply in Christ. Go in peace to love and serve others. You are dismissed.